Tonight's session features our very own esteemed C100 member, Charles Wang, as moderator. Mr. Wang is currently the president of the Chinese Cultural and Art Association and previously led the Chinese American Planning Council and China Institute. During his extensive career in public service, Mr. Wang was notably appointed by President Jimmy Carter as a member of the President's Commission on Mental Health. Mr. Wang, along with a handful of other like-minded individuals, was among the earliest members of C100. Thank you, Mr. Wang. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, very, very happy to uh, help to moderate this very important session. And we are so fortunate to have Dr. Zhong Gao to uh, be the uh, keynote speaker. She's going to share with us uh, her study and her experience, particularly on the topic of our students uh, impacted by this uh, coronavirus. As uh, just a starter, uh, I did pick up uh, this news a couple of days ago. Uh, there's a major group called Kaiser Family Foundation, and they issued a report on April the 2nd, uh, study on the impact of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. The study indicated 45% of Americans have actually uh, indicated that they, they have experienced a degree of fear, anxiety, depression, and uh, certainly uh, they, they are still uh, uh, worried about what's going to happen uh, because it's such a, shall we say, a major, major uh, disaster and an impact on everyone's life, particularly on our students from China. So uh, Dr. Gao is going to touch on that. We know uh, you, you have uh, uh, heard from Dr. Gao before. Uh, Dr. Gao is an associate professor of the uh, School of Social Development and Social Policy at Fordham University. And she earned her PhD from University of Beijing uh, some years back, and she has been very active in the field of uh, psychology, and she holds many, many important positions with the Chinese Mental Health Association, American Psychological Association, and the Chinese Psychological Society. And she received the most popular teacher's award for undergraduate study students in Fordham University. As a clinician, he received training mainly in psychoanalytic therapy and CBT and uh, Ericksonian hypnotherapy. So we're really fortunate to have her. Now I'm going to uh, pass the time uh, to uh, Dr. Gao for her presentation. Let's give her a big welcome. Thank you. For Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles, and it's my pleasure. I think that the time is very limited, so I think that I will just um, go through my slides, and I think I can share my slides and uh, with all of you. And um, it's my pleasure to be here, of course, uh, in this very special circumstances. And I think I want to save more time for question and answer if. Um, we have, you know, enough time and questions. So my, um, this is my title. And I think that uh, for one thing, you know, uh, today's agenda, I want to address mainly two points. One is what are impacts of um, COVID-19 outbreak on mental health in general. And then um, I will say something more about the impacts of COVID, uh, you know, COVID-19 outbreak on college students and how we can help them, uh, actually what we have been doing uh, to help them to cope and I will share some of the lessons from the Fudan University. And um, then I will prepare some of the takeaway messages for you, for students, for parents, and for professionals. This is my agenda. And um, I think that I wanted to mention that um, actually um, our work um, for students and also the general public who are suffering from COVID-19 still, you know, still continues. I think it's, it will be a long battle. And, um, uh, but anyway, so China is, you know, uh, I think it's completed the first stage of battle with COVID-19 outbreak. So we can, you know, I hopefully I can share some of the data. Maybe after you get the data, you feel better because that um, you feel that it's more hopeful. And um, from my own point of view, I just wanted to present one very strong belief that the um, COVID-19 uh, can be under control. And uh, our life will go back to the track, uh, maybe with some different, you know, different perspectives, which will be actually something very normal about crisis. 
So uh, what is COVID-19 outbreak from a psychological perspective? And I think that I just presented some kind of um, um, you know, important uh, timelines from WHO, World Health Organization. And from a mental health perspective, this is really a major public personal psychological crisis. And it's especially true for the students and the people in the United States right now, because you are on the, the first stage of, um, you know, um, how to say, combating for um, COVID-19. And uh, for Chinese students and Chinese parents and for the general public, it's somewhat a, a different thing. So. The COVID-19 uh, continues to be a prolonged stressor. And uh, as a prolonged stressor, it's a chronic, more chronic stressor, you know, um, it has kind of a different impact on us. And um, more importantly, it will trigger and it interact with other, you know, common stressors in our life. So in a way that um, it's even more difficult to, you know, uh, deal with it. And um, just, this is a slide which just to say something about psychological crisis. I think that I will not say more about that because um, simply I presented some of the um, characters, definition of crisis, like personal crisis, system crisis. I think COVID-19, you know, as a pandemic, um, you know, as called for the, um, from the WHO, it's, it's not a personal crisis alone. It's definitely a system crisis. And since it affects the whole system, like the, not only the family, the community, and a, a, a one country, it affects internationally. You know, whole, from you know impact have a huge impact on our entire planet so it is definitely a system crisis which makes it more difficult to deal with it because the system will kind of break down of course you see that um in all countries there was always a period of time that where the system break down but then you know we are coming back you know with a system react to it and um, kind of um how to say you know rebalance from this chaotic situation and this is definitely the cri you know, characters of crisis. And um, so I listed you know, four points regarding to the key characters of crisis. I think one message I want to deliver is that um, first, there was a huge differences in terms of reaction to the, um, the crisis, right? And also you can see that, we can even see that there was a huge culture and uh, differences in terms of how we reacted to the coronavirus. And, um, and the, the second point is that, um, you know, we will actually go through a process of, um, you know, a falling down and a breaking down and imbalancing our system in a personal, in the personal sense and also in the system sense. But, you know, gradually we will come back. So this is really something that I wanted to, you know, emphasize here. And the final point I, I wanted to, to, you know, to point it out before I continue with the other slides is that, um, you know, crisis in the, in, in the stage of crisis, we have to make a choice, you know, and um, making a choice to do something is very important to take actions, right? And uh, who are more vulnerable? And because uh, as a mental health professional, you know, pro uh, practitioners, you know, um, I think in, in my entire career life, I'm trying to figure out, you know, who is more vulnerable, who wants more help, right? And I think in, in this kind of, um, you know, crisis, I mean, a nationwide crisis, or even you can say planet-wide crisis, we of course have some kind of, um, you know, a severe uh, high impact group. And uh, I just listed some of the um, criteria, like a four level model, but based on the severe impact, you know, put forward with Chinese Ministry of Health. So the first group and the second group are usually more vulnerable, right? And you can see that the general public you know, are less vulnerable than the confirmed patients from telemedical professions and also other personnel in service. This is for sure, you know. And, um, but we have to, you know, uh, kind of uh, bear in mind of other special groups. And I listed someone, you know, who are already have mental health or physical conditions. This is very important because we already seen a surge of the, um, you know, uh, their kind of um, concern, the concerns and also the distress levels for this group. Uh, that are already have mental health and physical conditions are, are especially high. So we have to pay attention to that. And also this is data from the um, uh, newly published articles of Lacent and uh, did by a, a prestigious um, you know, group of uh, Chinese mental health pr practitioners. And um, they pointed out, as you can see, you know, uh, that um, the, the estimate member of the people who have mental disorders in China is 170 million. And uh, if you know about the, um, you know, average kind of uh, age of 
uh, patients who suffer from mental health disorders. You know that one peak of the, um, the age group cohorts uh, is er, you know, young adults. Young adults are especially, uh, how to say, vulnerable for having all kinds of mental health problems. So this is something that I want to mention. And um, uh, I think it's the other thing is just a similar kind of a character. So I would just skip you know, continue. You know, I want to share something about the um, older data I can collect from the um, uh, public kind of media resource and also from the academic kind of a uh, uh, source. And, um, uh, but before I kind of uh, share the, some of the data with you, uh, which actually tells you a picture of how people in China, you know, uh, what are their mental health status uh, during the period of the um, COVID-19. I just want to mention that uh, it is very important to bear in mind that the timeline of outbreak in China, when we try to interpret the, um, the following data and the intervention, because um, I think that uh, you can see from this slide, right? And the um, uh, confirmed number of confirmed cases in China, in the mainland China, actually flattened around the, the third week, the third week of February. And uh, actually, you know, before that, the a kind of um, line is very steep. Right, so we observed a uh, rapid growth of the uh, cons you know, confirmed cases. We, you know, we saw that um, the rapid growth of the death toll, which was very similar to what happened in Europe and in the United States. So in Europe and the United States, it's um, uh, in the first stage, this, um, in this kind of very steep line, right? And then we flattened. So I think that um, if this, you know, uh, the measures, the measures, necessary measures are taken, so the line will be flattened. I think probably, you know, this is a good news, right? And uh, uh, some of the key points in data is that uh, one thing is Wuhan city was locked down on January 23rd, so around here, okay? And then we see a rapid growth of the number of confirmed cases. And also on January 31st, here, probably something here, right? And uh, uh, the WHO announced like um, the COVID-19, you know, epidemic as the um, public health, you know, emergency incidents, right? So this is also a very important, you know, kind of mark that we have to bear in our mind. And um, so this is slogan I copy from the WHO. I think it's very important, no health without mental health, right? So we got some data from the public surveys and uh, they, these data would, you know, with them, you know, uh, in different time zones. So I think it's putting together, it, you know, provides a, a kind of um, more or less complete picture of um, how Chinese people in general, you know, went through the stage, you know, when, uh, how to say, the line is very steep and then, then it flattened. So I got some kind of, um, you know, one was from the, uh, uh, one survey on public mental health status by you know, one of the biggest online psychological service provider. And um, actually they sampled two kind of uh, two times. One sample was finished on, you know, um, February the 7th and they published the data. And then, then they collected second round of, you know, data from February the 10th to 13th, right? So you can see that um, on the first data, you know, on the first time of the, the collecting data, I think the, the, um, the, the line was not, was not flattened. Right, it was still kind of steep. It was um, the cases were going down, you know, death toll was going going up, right? And on the second round, things was getting better. Things was getting under control. So you could see that, um, right, uh, I think the public mental health centers was lagged behind a bit, but it also shows something, you know, kind of, um, how to say, a good sign of recovery, okay? And we also observed some of the um, very interesting features I want to highlight here. So uh, the most salient negative emotions, and I got this message of repeated repeatedly from different kind of survey was anger. You know, uh, people are very angry, and then it's fear. So people are you know more angry than more fearful, right? So then fearful. So it's it's a very clear sign, right? And also we we still we see some typical vulnerable groups such as women, you know, in that in all age, women suffer, you know, more, are more likely to suffer from mental health issues than men, you know, in most psychological disorders and mental disorders, right? And we also see some of the interesting feature as those who have higher education level, which means that um, actually a master's degree above, they actually score the lowest in their mental health status, which means they reported, you know, you know more distress, 
regarding to this coronavirus. So usually high education, you know, and uh, high social economic status is a protective factor. But here we see something different, okay? But probably it's because of um, this first stage of the survey, right? And also they are angry, not because of the virus, you know, uh, coronavirus per se, it's angry about the, all those kind of measures and uh, what really happening, you know, during the period of the kind of um, COVID-19. I think I, I witnessed kind of similar patterns um, at least from my assess, uh, my assess of the information from like Italy and also from the United States. Okay, so this is something that we can bear in mind. And um, so you can see around 3%, 25, one quarter, quarter of the population, they reported you know, severe distress. And this data was kind of repeat, repeated in other surveys. Right, and this is a, a published article. I think it, this is a very important article because that um, uh, this survey, you know, was done by a prestigious, one of the most pre prestigious mental health group. That's um, the you know, the psychiatrist from the Shanghai Mental Health Center, which is uh, one of the biggest and the best center, uh, mental health center in China, and um, uh, they actually surveyed, you know, kind of a population from the January thirty first. The day when the WHO announced, you know, this uh, COVID-19 as major public kind of, uh, you know, concern, in a public health concern, right? And then they stopped uh, uh, around February the 10th. So they covered, you know, 11 days, which is, um, you know, uh, almost cover a one, you know, entire period of quarantine time, right? And uh, their sampling are more rep representative. So I take this away, you know, as a more kind of a valid picture of our the conditions. And um, I just highlighted some of the um, data. And as you can see that, um, uh, the, you know, all the, uh, I mean, the contents in red in, uh, indicated like high risk group. And it, um, how to say that the words that are, are colored with blue indicated low risk groups, as you can see, right? And uh, such as that, um, are again, around 35% of respondents experienced significant psychological distress, and uh, which was quite similar as uh, Charles reported, you know, just before my 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 lecture, that um, you know, um, maybe 40% of the uh, citizens in the United States reported that they're fearful, they're angry, or they are probably depressed, right? And the female and uh, younger young adult group, and the, also the older group, because they are kind of more, most vulnerable group for the COVID-19, right? The, that's the um, age groups above 60, right? And the higher education level, again, was correlated with higher distress schools. And also migrant workers and people from Hubei province. And as you can see that um, a good news is the stress level in general decreased, okay? You know, because it covered an almost entire, you know, time zone of quarantine. So it decreased at the end of their kind of survey, survey window, which is a good news, you know. And um, this is also, a you know, is consistent with the theoretical observations and also our previous experiences in the field that, um, you know, the crisis response generally decreases as the crisis is under control. So this is a good news for all of us, right? And, um, and also some of the data from hotline providers. And uh, by the way, I just offer two resources, especially probably for students and parents that are now uh, living the, in, in, uh, not in China, but in other countries, such as in New York. If, um, if you wanted to kind of uh, um, seek a kind of a service provider from who can speak Chinese and who are now in China. And um, so you can use these services. These services are provided by two major hotline, you know, that, that are very active now in China. One is from the uh, Huazhong Normal University. The university itself is located in Wuhan. And um, this is authorized by the Chinese Ministry of Health, this hotline. And the other is the hotline and counseling, online counseling service provided by Beijing Normal University, one of the best university in terms of psychology. And um, so I just to give, you know, the sources here so, though, so you can see. And um, I think that I'm Again, there are some kind of interesting data, right? And I just want to highlight, you know, something about changes of need. As you can see, the number of calls, uh, according to the hotlines for, uh, provided by the Beijing Normal University, direct, you know, directly related to outbreak. The calls that are directly related to outbreak significantly dropped. 
since the mid March. Okay, so but other concern, you know, kind of uh, uh, emerged, especially from those high impact group, such as patients, frontline medical professionals, and people who experienced more traumatic response in the COVID-19. But in from the general public, the needs drop down. Okay, right. This is very important, and also we they are dealing with different kind of problems. I am I'm self is providing this kind of hotline service based on my personal experience. Um, in the first stage, many calls were related to the direct concern of the uh, COVID-19. They're angry, they're fearful, they're anxious of being infect infected. But later, you know, fewer calls are related to COVID-19. And actually in the past two or three weeks, you know, all the calls I picked up were not related to COVID-19 outbreak, but for other concerns, more kind of common major concerns such as intimate relationships, marriage problems, you know, kind of worries about academic pressure, such as things. Okay, so um, I think this is a, a mental health data, especially for, you know, a, a particularly for college students. And um, this is a kind of an earlier stage of survey, as you can see from the January 31st to the February 3rd. So when the line was still steep, right? And uh, you can see they assess depression symptoms, they, they assess kind of anxiety symptoms, right? And they also kind of, uh, you know, uh, assessed, uh, assessed the, uh, the knowledge about COVID-19. And this is their major kind of finding. And I think one is very interesting. I want to highlight, not this time, not the um, vulnerable group, as you can see very clearly here, but the protective factors. One is among college students, you know, age seems to be a very important. So if you're older, yeah, compared with probably freshmen, you cope better, right? And a high level of knowledge about COVID-19, which means that if you have, you know, more detailed, high quality knowledge, you know, public health knowledge, I mean, public health knowledge of COVID-19, and uh, you wanted to change your healthy, you know, health behaviors, then the distress level was also lower. So this is a protective phase. And um, finally, I want to share some of the online survey from FDU students. And this is not a kind of um, formal survey, it's informal, because I, you know, I prepared a kind of uh, emotion regulation, open kind of uh, online uh, lectures for Fudan University students. So I asked one of my students to organize a, to did an informal survey about their needs. So this is something, uh, what we got from, you know, a, a survey uh, uh, only for Fudan University. So we got a, a a pretty nice sample, I have to say. And uh, so you can see that for this survey, the time window changes. It happens, it took place when the line flattened. Okay, so it's very different, right? And then if you look at their needs and major concern, so I just listed. And if you look at, it seems that it's, it's sometimes it's hard for you even to tell, you know, uh, whether it was something related to COVID-19 or it's just a kind of a normal, stressors among college students. I would say normal stressors, of course. Um, the exception is, you know, how to adapt to um, online teaching because it's a very important, you know, new mode and also feeding boredom and the concerned and, you know, and to miss their boyfriend, girlfriends and long distance relationship. That's very normal concern. And this is having comfort with the parents, which I wanted to highlight. So other issues I just list here because I, I didn't want, I, I probably I don't have time to, you know, uh, to say more about that, right? Because I have to say, yeah. So let's summarize what of the key data, right? As a pandemic, right? And especially at the beginning of the, the stage, COVID-19 outbreak in the short run, you know, maybe regarded as personal traumatic event or major life events. As you can see, these are the major features of the COVID-19 outbreak on mental health, right? So um, I will skip that. Yeah, yeah, the protective factors. And also, and in the long run, because COVID-19 outbreak in China, you know, at the end of the, from the, um, the, the fourth week of January till now, and almost two and three months passed. And I, I found that it was really getting, going, kind of goes chronic, right? And so very clearly it triggers interacts with other personal stressors. And for college students, and uh, we have highlighted in my, my mind is the college students themselves without COVID-19, they're already struggling with a lot of developmental problems and concerns and struggle, especially to establish their identities. So their self-esteem and self-regulation issues are already very salient without COVID-19. 
but with COVID-19, it adds some kind of uh, extra pressures. And I also, you know, coined the word, this is not a real syndrome. I just um, coined this kind of syndrome. I said back home syndrome. I list some of the um, kind of features, like um, it's, it's it happening all around China, I think. And uh, for college students, like disruption of novel routine and increased conflicts with parents as time goes by and loneliness. And, uh, and the third point also, the feeding of boredoms and being stuck and meaningless. And the third point is more like depressive, depressive symptoms, right? And at, at the first stage of the COVID-19, it's more like anxiety. And then anger, anxiety, and then depression. So this is something that I, I have in my mind. And um, so high risk group, I also list something like that. So I think that it's very important to bear in mind that um, um, you know we have to kind of uh, be more vigilant of those more high risk groups, including students who have infected or have infected family members. So this is the first level kind of um, high impact group, and also the people already students already have mental health issues. And I just listed some of the common. The most common mental health problems among college students population, you know, especially in China, as you can see. And um, uh, and actually, uh, according to my observation, the second need and the second and the fifth groups of needs for practical help and psychological help, not directly related to. I want to emphasize here, not directly related to COVID nineteen increases as the outbreak is under control. So uh, now I want to share something about how we actually in Fudan address students of mental health issues before the COVID-19. I just want to give you a picture. It's because um, um, there, of course, is a major change, but there is continuity uh, you know, in terms of our service providing for the um, students, right? And um, so that you can compare with your systems, right? And students in general, you know, and of course, one student always circled with different kind of a social, you know, supportive groups, family, roommates, you know, class, classmates, teachers, and partners and friends, right? And um, so uh, in, in China, in, in Fudan University, every school or department of in Fudan University, we have a very special kind of work group termed student affair work group. And, uh, you know, under the, the, you know, leadership of student affair group, three kind of, you know, people uh, may have very kind of, uh, you know, have play a very important roles in mental health you know, issues with students, but not only in mental health, of course, like the supervisor, especially for, you know, graduate students, student advisor, which is a very key role in China, if you know something about China, but I don't have, you know, a, a lot of time to kind of, you know, detail, uh, you know, describe the, this roles in details. And also we got a student of peer educators for every classroom. Okay, so the student advisor has a very close contact with students. And in our university. And by the way, I am one of the student advisors, so I have very close contact. And our con my contact with my students actually increased rapidly within the COVID-19 period. And if the students have their mental problems, they wanted to seek help, they can directly go to our Student Center for Psychological Education and Counseling, and which actually, you know, uh, has two major tasks. One is psychological education, the other is counseling service. I think this is kind of uh, universal, you know, uh, at least this is very common structures and um, kind of uh, work tasks uh, uh, within Chinese, uh, within Chinese mainland university, probably in other countries, it's very similar. So these are services. And for TARS counseling service, we got uh, individual face-to-face -face sessions offered for students. They can book the time in a crisis intervention when it's needed, group counseling when it's needed. And also, you know, if the student's case is more severe, we, we, we actually have uh, kind of pointed over 10, you know, psychiatrists who will kind of do assessment. And if it's necessary, we'll do a further referral to the psychiatrist kind of hospital. So when they can get medications and even hospitalizations if needed. And however, you know, you can see the student affair work group has a very close contact with this, you know, student center for psychology education and counseling in terms of crisis. So if the students is in high risk group or it's already happened a crisis here, so there was a huge kind of, a, how to say, collaboration between the two parts. And also, you know, uh, if there was something really happened, like a high crisis, like suicidal crisis, the student affair group will have to contact the family members of the students. So this is a basically, you know, before the, the COVID-19. And after COVID-19, so what happened? And we move almost everything online, right? 
So again, the students is struggled with their kind of environment. Of course, they have more close contact with their family members. They have less contact with the other things, right? And um, so again, the students department, we got this uh, three, this kind of three layer structures. And again, there was a, you know, as a very even closer contact between student advisor and students. Okay, so then again, of course, they can book all kind of online service from the Student Center for Psychology Education and Counseling at Fudan University. But as I said before, we move everything online, everything, almost everything, as you can see. That we adapted our, you know, previous form of service and um, we just move it online, right? And of course, uh, you can't do kind of, um, you know, group sessions online, although you can, but it's, it's more difficult. So we replace group, group kind of um, those counseling service with the internet-based hotline service. And hotline plays a huge important role in this kind of a mental health help providing for uh, anyone who suffer from the um, impact of uh, COVID-19. So I highly recommend this kind of service, right? And again, this is very normal. This is almost the, the entire thing. The only thing difference is we move everything online. Of course, because we can't actually contact the students directly. So things is getting a bit kind of complicated, right? Because we can't meet the students. We have to rely on all the information we get either from directly report from the students or we get some information that we get collected from the family members. So this things can get a, you know, a bit complicated. But things get even more complicated if the student is not living in China right now. They are actually right now currently in overseas training program during COVID-19. That's a major challenge, right? And um, you see that students in a foreign country and the, uh, he, his or her kind of uh, immediate environment, the social support works actually changes, as you can see, right? And uh, some students even have no local friends in a class, you know, local friends, right? Especially for this kind of short-term training program, it's, it's a bit uh, kind of harder. And so, which means their social support systems is, you know, less working, right? And um, so for foreign, you know, for students in overseas exchange program, we have another kind of work group where deal with their kind of um, normal activities that is the foreign affair work group, right? Again, you know, because of COVID-19, we just, I dropped the um, uh, peer educator because, you know, that student cannot really provide any direct help. So this is the structure from the department level, right? So again, the student advisor have to keep a very close contact with the student, even he or she is overseas, right? And also the foreign affair work group will work closely with the student as well. And uh, we got a kind of international cooperation division from Fudan Universities, which has a huge, you know, with a close contact with the, um, the every foreign affair work groups under the school or department. And of course, the, uh, the international cooperation divisions work you know, it's supposed to work, some, you know, closely with the local school, pro, you know, program provider, right? And when a student has some kind of a psychological needs, right? And one way is, you know, directly, like he, he or she can still seek help, especially online help from our uh, school student center, you know, and um, uh, he or she can actually kind of have uh, online sessions, right? Booked online sessions. And, uh, but uh, as you can see, it is very tricky because that um, sometimes we can't really know until the crisis is already there. Right? And uh, we can't detect early risk, you know, signals. We can't, re you know, react earlier. So then we have to rely on kind of cooperations between, you know, the uh, local school kind of program provider with the local school mental health service. And uh, it takes a longer time to react and respond. And also it takes a lot of more, uh, way more kind of uh, cooperations between different sectors. Even we have to work with different time zones. So this is more difficult. And um, students can also, you know, get a kind of a, you know, service from the local school mental health service. That's the thing, right? So I just want to give a summary because the time, I think my, I'm, I'm already, you know, spend 30, 30, almost 35 time, 35 minutes in discussing the, um, the slides. Um, I'll just give a summarize. So what strategies are effective so far? One thing is start online public health education on COVID-19 outbreak. I want to you know, emphasize here. So I think that I, especially in this first stage of, you know, of a COVID-19 outbreak, it's very important or it's imperative to provide high quality public health education, not psychological health, 
but public house educations for students to say if they got knowledge they know what to do they know how to take you know efficient effective measures to protect themselves actually they are less stressful so this is very important and also with psychological education about accurate response and coping strategy we do different lectures uh, we do kind of brochures we do online kind of uh, resources kind of provider we're providing all kind of resources you know uh, i think here really knowledge is power and also use pre-existing online service and you know change face-to-face -face service you know to certain forms of teletherapy this is i think we're doing all around china and also provide hotline if possible if the school if the university is able to provide hotlines for their students only which was a you know kind of privilege but i think for more universities it's very hard it's difficult then instead of um you know doing on hotlines uh for their own students you know university probably can actually get some resources of high quality local hotlines that provide this information to the students so that they can use the local resources and also i think it's very important is to stay connected with students by all means and try to detect early risk factors you know or signals because we already observe a, a little bit kind of trend of um, suicidal kind of crisis among chinese populations so this is a warning sign and um, also very important to form work group if it's necessary especially to deal with high risk cares cases i just um, you know i uh, mentioned some of the members uh, that must be included at least in Fudan University, like students, their parents, student advisors, head of department of you know, student affairs office, mediators, intermediator from the Fudan University Student Counseling Center, and other members if necessary. For instance, if we deal with a um, you know, student who is currently in overseas exchange program and he or she is in crisis, then we included you know, the head of foreign affairs you know, office. Uh, we may include some of the um, representative from the local university program and to form a kind of work group. And the major challenge here is also obvious because COVID-19 is definitely a serious test of how good the pre-existing system is. So if the pre-existing system, especially the supportive network intervention system is good enough, then you know, probably will be able to provide good enough service for the students. However, if it is not good enough, you know, you can't expect that it can work you know, under this high level pressure. And also quarantine and social distancing measures, because we take uh, perversive, kind of, you know, a massive um, measures here and make it more difficult, of course, to coordinate and cooperate in the system. So we have to rely on a lot of, inf you know, information exchanges online, uh, uh, using WeChat platform and telephones, and we can't meet students, parents face to face. So of course, it, you know, increase the, this kind of uh, um, working difficult, increase the difficulties of um, coordinating and cooperating. All right, so this is really the major challenge. Okay, so um, I think that are already some, um, um, okay, I think that I will, you know, shift to the question and answers after I finish this. So finally, I prepared three slides for the, for the students, for the parents, and for the, you know, professionals like me, helping professionals. And I think that uh, because I, I suppose that, you know, uh, the major population uh, from this time, the audience is in the United States. So I think that um, because um, in the United States, the virus, the, the, you know, the COVID-19 is still in the first or early stage of outbreak. So very important message you have to bear in mind is almost all your responses are normal, right? And these responses, you know, however, it uh, seems to be threatening or bizarre, they are really normal responses towards accurate, you know, abnormal, unexpected crisis. And these responses were diminished, as you can see from all the data, right? All the data from different time zoom, actually the, the stress level decreases, right? And the needs for service also decreases, right? And, uh, you know, it can be under control. I firmly believe that the COVID-19 you know, outbreak is able to be under control. And, uh, and also get high quality public service information you know, you really need to know something, you know, uh, accurately about COVID-19. And practice recommended health behaviors. It will help you. And it decreases distress. And, um, you know, it decreases worries. And try to take yourself. That's kind of grammar therapy uh, or grammar or kind of recipe, but it's highly recommended. And one tiny but important message is you need to monitor, you know, the time exposure uh, of the information. 
uh, in terms of COVID-19. So my recommendation is cut off the time of using public media and social media. You have to monitor your exposure time. And if you feel that um, after kind of a long time, you know, um, using of social mediums, especially to assess all, all, all information about COVID-19, all those tragic stories, all those terrible pictures, you actually felt worse than just stop. It was very important, right? And then we already have some preliminary data that um, the high exposure of social medium and public mediums, uh, you know, on the information of COVID-19 is are, are, are positively correlated with the distress level, okay? So, and uh, the other is, as I say, stay connected with important members of social support work through all kinds of means, but in a reciprocal ways, which means you, you get help from them and you provide help, which is a, a better kind of a win-win solution. And also seek professional help whenever you are in need. And uh, try to use hotline service if you can, right? Especially when you feel that you, you feel very bad, you know, for a certain period of time. And for parents, uh, this is just a, a typical individual reactions in crisis. I just list all the symptoms and they are very common symptoms and you can check. And if you find similar symptoms that are listed on this kind of table, you know, good news, you are very normal. You know, because normal people react to the, this kind of, uh, you know, crisis in a very bizarre way, but which is very normal. And plus these reactions may subside, right? Okay, so for parents, Right, and I think first copy all the messages, you know, I recommend for your kids because you are human beings and the human beings, we human beings react very similar to this kind of crisis. And, uh, and you know that from the, uh, my experience of working with Chinese parents and also the collection, you know, experience, my personal experiences and my college experiences. And it's very important in this period of time to lower parents' expectation on kids, okay? So I just provide a, a kind of, um, how to say, uh, a num thumb rule of thumb that if you cannot fulfill your own expectations, then better to lower them, especially in this period of time, uh, to kind of decrease the family conflicts. Right, and um, if you feel overwhelmed by your kids, right, and uh, one very good advice for you is just do even more social distancing at home, right, to provide you with your own private, you know, room or space or time, which is very important. Because this kind of, um, you know, uh, outbreak is a huge test on our own individual ability to regulate emotions. And um, you know that our brain is very vulnerable, you know, in this period of time. So you can't really rely your brain to react perfectly. So one of the best strategy is just to distance yourself and to remove you from a very kind of um, threatening environment, even at home. So this is something that I provide you with, you can think about that. And finally, for the um, professionals, again, copy all the messages recommended for students and parents because probably you are also parents, right? And, uh, and also, I think it's very useful, at least for me, you know, cause that um, for uh, kind of professionals uh, working normal settings, we're not so used to, you know, provide a crisis intervention or hotline service, but, uh, if, uh, but these are very important in COVID-19 outbreak. So get extra training on that if you feel that it's necessary. And the other thing is, you know, uh, one thing that our personal experience as also I, you know, I heard from my colleagues that um, we do as a helping professional experience high level of helplessness and a feeling of guilties, you know, uh, when we provide service, especially for high impact group, for people who suffer from the disease and also, you know, for the um, frontline medical kind of professionals. Because, um, yeah, this is really helpless. You know, we, we can't do many, many things for them, actually. Sometimes we can't do anything, you know, I mean, practically. But uh, still providing a pathetic ear here, you know, ear is very important. And we have to believe ourselves that our work really matters. And um, the final uh, messages for, for all professionals is also um, a lesson learned from my own experience is that um, uh, this mental health service period will be very long. So, you know, I experienced that uh, my stress level, working stress level actually, you know, is not flattened when the line is flattened. Actually, it increases because, um, you know, as you can see, the more chronic, you know, kind of stressors are even more difficult to deal with. So just be aware of sign of burnout and stay connected with your colleagues. Uh, that's all for my presentation. And uh, thank you for listening. And this is
you know, a picture from Fudan University and I hope that uh, one day you can come to Fudan University and enjoy probably a very nice springtime. Uh, this Thank season you. is uh, one of the, yeah, great right. Presentation. Really enlightening us. I want to ask the first question. I know there's a few questions lined up already. If I'm a parent, I'm asking you, should I bring my uh, boys or girl home at this particular juncture? Would you uh, give them the advice? Should they stay in the campus or where they study or they should come home? I think you know, this, is a, uh, this is a common question raised, actually, uh, uh, by the um, parents of overseas. I think I want to copy the advice from you know, uh, uh, top physicians also the leader of the COVID-19 uh, combat, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Zhang Wenhong. And um, I think I would just uh, say something very similar, uh, you know, uh, like he said. The first thing is you, you have to think about like, um, so if you come back to China, so uh, when you want to return to, whether you want to return to the United States, you know, and um, uh, in a shorter or longer period of time. So for instance, um, if you think that, um, you know, um, you can come back in, to China and you have a lot of things to do and it's easy and safer for you to come back to the United States, then probably you can consider uh, the coming back. And also you need to concern of all the risk factors. And there was a high risk of, um, um, you know, getting contact, you know, uh, being infected uh, of the virus uh, through the, the entire journey. And also there was a problem of getting the airline. So you, you need to balance this. And actually, if you can find a, how to say, a safer place to stay in the United States, you got, you got place to stay, you got enough food, you got enough kind of, uh, how to say, protective kind of facial mask, something like that, maybe you just stay, right? And you see that, um, right, there was always, you know, risks of coming back. Of course, if you can't really find a decent life living conditions in the United States, then it leaves you no choice, right? If you, you can't, you know, if you, you, you have no place to, to live, if you have, you know, no access to the, you know, public health service, if you cannot get access to the um, education uh, you want, right? And you have a very, you know, strong family back in China, then I think that the choice you can make is also clear. So this is something that I just recommended. And uh, so that's, that's, that's also the, you know, message I give to my students who currently, you know, stay in the um, uh, overseas countries because of the exchange programs, right? Okay. We have a number of questions on the screen. Dr. Gao, would you care to pick them up? We have a yeah. Okay, so one, one idea is, is GEM, which is exactly a psychological service does the hotline provide. I think it's, it's right. One thing is, of course, we can offer basic, uh, you know, like a, a powerful empathy and listening, active listening empathy towards, you know, uh, emotional support towards the, um, the people who, who cause. And uh, for hotlines, the major kind of uh, uh, task for hotline is provide emotional support and to kind of, um, you know, um, elicit resources you know, from that persons who cause. And we firmly believe that every people in this planet has their own resources and you can mobilize your resources to combat, you know, the, um, this kind of crisis. So the major concern for the hotline is to, hotline provider is to elicit, you know, resources, protective factors from this, you know, uh, I mean, the core, the, the people who call. So this, is, so this is not only talk, but we may provide kind of, a, also we may provide direct advice or some basic information. You know, and early callers, a lot of them uh, have concerns about COVID-19 and we found out they probably do not get enough knowledge about COVID-19. So we also provide information about that, right? And of course, there are a few of them, they were really in crisis. I mean, they are attempting suicide. So the final task for hotline is to save life. Okay. Exactly. We have in okay. New York a 24-7 uh, suicide prevention hotline and it's answered by Chinese uh, language counselors uh, in addition to many other languages. So that's in, in, the, in the work. Here, there's a question here. 
What are something you have found helpful to say to students who are anxious, depressed about their situation right now? Oh, good question. I think um, um, the number one suggestion, it's not a suggestion, the sentence I say to my students is, that's normal. That's normal. Your reactions are normal. These reactions are normal reaction to stress, right? And you are doing pretty good. Because this is our system's you know, kind of a response. I think this is usually the first sentence I say to everyone. That's normal, right? That's normal reactions. And which means that you are reacting quite good with the whole systems. Your system is trying to protect yourself. And then, you know, depending on what kind of stressors, I will try to identify the stressors they have, right? And uh, why probably they are depressed or anxious. Then based on the information I get, I will offer some direct suggestions, like, um, you know, some kind of coping strategies, right? And I think that um, um, in this period of time, you know, the way I work is more directive than in the usual setting. So I will directly offer some suggestions, advice. Of course, they can reject them. But as a way to increase the flexibility of their, you know, internal kind of work, internal, internal world, right? So you offer more perspectives and they can take it, right? So I, I you know, I kind of expand their visions. Because right? when you were in crisis, usually you had this kind of tunnel visions, right? Your kind of perspective is shrinked. So by offering suggestion, you don't really need to take them, but by offering suggestion, a different way to do, then you get different things. So I think normalization is the, the, the number one thing I do. And then I provide advices. And of course, you know, I provide a lot of um, how to say, emotional support tools, right? This is something that I usually do. Next question. I'm curious about the way of peer support in this period. If it's based on weight check, official? Okay, account. good question. Mm -hmm. um, peer support is by two things. It's one is like uh, we offer a formal kind of a WeChat account you know, but organized by students themselves. And so that students can kind of, uh, how to say, uh, uh, leave messages under the, this kind of public account. And then students um, who are the so-called peer educators will actually give feedbacks to these, you know, comments or messages. So by, by this, by doing this, it's, it's kind of a formal way of peer support. And um, um, as far as I know that there are other kind of in, more informal one is that some students just, you know, sign up kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, group, you know, informal group to support each other. And one very important function is that they just remind themselves of, uh, you know, of uh, keeping a kind of, um, you know, regular time schedule. Like, um, you know, they will call each other's, you know, of course, online and uh, when it's time to get up. Right? and exchange kind of informations about their academic, you know, kind of uh, work or some of the minor problems they have within this kind of circle, right? So actually, I think it's, it's actually helpful because um, as I said, one of the um, biggest challenge, I said back home syndrome is that, um, you know, COVID-19 disrupt our normal schedules, normal routines, and which actually uprooted us from the normal environment, especially the academic and social environment, which, plays a very important role in regulate our behaviors. And because without this environment, it's really hard for anyone to regulate our behaviors. And so by, you know, signing up for this kind of a self-help group, you know, you actually get, you know, kind of encouragement from each other's and try to, they provide an actual, you know, regular framework, which may help students to regulate their daily schedule. Yeah, this is one way of, you know, kind of uh, peer support. So you can see that in this COVID-19 outbreak, you know, more, more basic things like um, physical needs, like uh, time management, like regular routine, they come first. And they are, first, they are among the first thing to be interrupted. And so usually our, you know, service, or um, the service we provided, usually first goes to that level of needs, okay? Physical needs, you know, safety issues and the daily routines and the eating and sleeping. And uh, before we move on the ladder to the more like self-esteem, you know, kind of uh, sense of belonging things, right? So this is the basic logic for providing service. 
another question is, uh, d does our student have a health insurance? Does the health insurance cover mental health also? No, uh, they cover. Yeah, they cover a kind of um, you know, uh, for all the service psychological service we provide, it's for it's for free. Okay, just university just provide free kind of uh, mental health service for the students, and if they want to kind of they need kind of medications and uh, or hospitalizations, these part is covered by the you know med medical insurance for the students. Um. I think that um, you know the COVID nice is all over the place. Yes, but still you can choose not to read them. You know, you just turn off the uh, cell phone. You just put away of um, you know uh, any you know means to access to the social media. And uh, of course, you are curious. Of course, we all want to have information, and we are hunger for the information. And my suggestion is that uh, you set up a time, and probably for instance, have an hour or one hour. You know particularly, and you just read all the news. And uh, um, aside of that time zoom, you do something else. You know, you just limited the time, the exposure within a time zoom, okay? And uh, within that time zoom, one hour or half an hour, you just read everything. But then you just, you know, leave it. That's, that's hey, what we do. I want to volunteer. He asked, do you have any shortage of professionals that uh, can chat? can deliver the services over hotline? Um, I think, you know, that's a very interesting answer, your questions. You know, as far as I know, for the major hotlines I visit, uh, we are not short of our professional, you know, providers. And uh, uh, for instance, the, the first hotline, the Huazhou Normal University hotlines, actually when this hotline was open for, you know, recruitment, uh, uh, you know, for more than 40,000, 4,000, 4,000, you know, kind of uh, practitioners, you know, applied. And the hotline take, you know, around one, 1,500, right? So, uh, so they, they turned down the application of, you know, more than half of the um, applicants, right? So I think that uh, here now is not a shortage of, of, you know, professional who provide hotlines. And as far as I know that in New York, you even have more, you know, mental health providers, right? And um, the number of therapists and counselors are very, very large in New York. And so, not bilingual, but, though. not bilingual, not Chinese speaking. You have yeah. more English than Chinese speaking. That's why even the counselors you mentioned in the school, we, we have a shortage of Chinese speaking counselors, mostly the Caucasians, who you have to make an appointment on the average is two weeks that you can see a counselor by appointment. So, by so that's your right. Is with, yeah. <laughs> that's why I actually put, you know, posted the two kind of uh, hotline uh, service, you know, uh, to the um, to our audience, and they can speak Chinese, and they also can speak English, the providers, right. and they offer kind of a free hotline service to overseas students and also the general public, and um, and this this hotline is especially for you know, oversee students or the general public. And they got trained. And, um, you know, of course, no, no one can do perfect jobs here, but um, I think that the qualities are good enough, above good enough, right? So you, if you, you want to use, you know, this kind of service, you can't find adequate, you know, service in, in local place, mostly language barrier and culture barrier, of course they are there. So you can try to just as to these services, right? and uh, at least to help. Lloyd, we're just that's... about reaching the point. So what do you say? Thank you so much, Dr. Gao and Mr. Wang, for you both for making the time for this wonderful talk. I think ending on hotlines is a really great reminder for the kinds of mental health resources that all of us in the States really need to you know, see as a resource that we can use during these uncertain times. Um, thank you everybody who tuned in tonight and providing such insightful questions. Our final session is this coming Monday, April 6th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific Time with Professor, uh, Principal Jian Wu and Deputy Director uh, Jian Yu Lo of the high school affiliated to Fudan University in Shanghai with moderator Dr. Evan Glazer, head of school at the Avenue School in New York City. Please be sure to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn and please take care. and. 
all the materials from this session will be made available on our YouTube channel and on our social media. So stay tuned. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, being able to uh, lead the discussion. And we learned yeah. a lot. Thank you. Thank you for Charles. Thank you for Charles moderation. Thank you for participating. And uh, please take care. And uh, hope that we can meet again somewhere in the future. Yeah. <laughs>